The Odyssey is almost over. Odysseus returns. He vanquishes the suitors who had taken up residence in his home, hoping to marry his wife, Penelope. But rather than joyously welcoming home her long, her long lost husband, we are told that Penelope slept through the night slept through the slaughter of the suitors, and when her attendant Euryclea announces the great news to her mistress that the suitors who had plagued her are gone and her husband has returned after 20 long years, Penelope doesn't believe a word of it. She goes downstairs. Odysseus is bathed by a servant and beautified by Athena and the two of them sit at opposite ends of the table looking at each other. She admits, yes, the man across the table does bear a strong resemblance to her husband, but she refuses to believe that it is he. In his book, An Odyssey, A Father, A Son, and an Epic, Daniel Mendelssohn, also the author of The Lost, A Search for Six of the Six Million, writes how this moment in the story raises a question we understand better with age, but that it is really always being asked. When the exterior, the face and body have changed beyond recognition, what remains? Is there an inner eye that survives time? How do we know who someone is when outward appearances can no longer be relied upon? I want to name something about this moment. Ye score is always hard but it may be particularly disorienting this year. For those in our community who've been members of Bethel for a long time, it was disorienting last year at the Carolina Theater, but perhaps less so because that, we could say, was a different room. It was a different building altogether. But returning to this room, facing this way, and not that, even if East is correct, with the memorial boards where the ark once was, without the pews, without the seats where our loved ones sat, is disorienting. The room has changed. And we may be wondering if the memories of our loved ones, of all those who came before us, if they can survive even, even when this place's outward appearance has changed so much. In 1987, Rabbi Susan Schnur wrote a column in the Philadelphia Exponent about the empty seats in the synagogue of her youth. Adath Israel in Trenton, New Jersey, the seats of those who were no longer living. She writes, my grandfather and grandmother sat over against the wall on the left. My parents sat behind them in aisle seats, then my aunt and uncle. And she goes on to describe with beautiful detail the many people of Adat Israel and where they sat, the way that we might describe people at Bethel and where they sat. Like Rabbi Fisher, who sat in the second row on the aisle on the right, or how Charlie would sway in the back of the pews, dressed in white, or how Steve Cassell would sit where Larry and Andre or Artie or Sandy Kessler, wherever they were, and sing and sing so sweetly. 
Rabbi Schnur continues, every few years or so, someone would be missing. And we knew that something had happened to that person during the year. We had the long view on these people. We knew nothing about them from day to day, not even their names, but we knew their lives from year to year. We kept track of them over the decades. That was enough. It was a different kind of knowing. My childhood synagogue is both a distant and near country to me, a place pregnant with geography. It seemed that everyone I knew in life except the mailman, all my brother's friends and my mother's friends, everyone in the neighborhood and from school and piano recitals and summer camp were fixed like pieces of a wooden puzzle of the United States, all set down in their places in this one still room. I read her description but wondered what if the puzzle pieces change? What if the pews, if the orientation, if the external appearances of the room are no longer here? Odysseus is frustrated and tells Euryclea to make up a bed for him, which gives Penelope her opening. Penelope also tells her to make up a bed for him, but not any bed, Odysseus's own bed, which she orders to be moved into the hallway outside the royal bed chamber. And on hearing Penelope's instructions, Odysseus loses control of himself. He knows the bed would be virtually impossible to move, quote, unless a god himself came down because this great secret sign is wrought into the bed itself, which I made no one else, a tree of spear-leafed olive grew inside the lot, full-grown, thriving, as massive as a pillar. I wrought it from the bedpost, drilled all the holes, and went on from there to fashion the whole bed. My design, I say to you clearly, that this is our sign. Mendelssohn teaches classics at Bard College. His father took his class on the Odyssey with him during the year before he died. And when they studied this moment in the Odyssey, his father spoke up because he was the only one in the class of 18 and 20 year olds who had any idea of what it's like to be with someone so long that they don't look anything like the person that you started out with. His father explained to the class what Odysseus means when he declares about the, dead's, about the bed's secret construction, this is our sign. These are the things you have with someone, not physical things, but private jokes and memories you gather over time. Little things that nobody else knows about small things between people can be the foundation of the greatest intimacy. When you have these things, they keep you connected long after everything else becomes unrecognizable. What are the little things that you treasure about those you love? What are the small things only you and your loved one knew about. It's those things that we remember today. They're not contained in outward appearances. As Rabbi Sager said on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, our memories don't live in his favorite piece of wood next to the ark or in a particular pew where our loved one sat or swayed or stood. They are both smaller and larger than those outward appearances. They are little things like the way someone walked or the jokes they told or a dish only they could make for you or that you could make for them or the kindness in their voice or the way they gave us a hug hello. I really loved Mendelssohn's book. It's written by a son about the last year of his father's life. I remember my own father today. 
along with grandparents and teachers and friends. I remember two people who prayed with us at the Carolina Theater last year, not knowing they would not live to see this day. I remember Shiva Minions and conversations and Kaddishes that we recited together for your loved ones and friends whose funerals you flew to and from which you returned coming home back to Bethel to find comfort and community. There's one more kernel that I want to share with you. Mendelssohn explains that to understand the name Odysseus, you have to think of the word anodyne, which is a pain-killing drug. It's a compound, he writes, of two Greek words, which together mean without pain. The an is the without, and so the odyne has to be pain. And this is the root of Odysseus' name and of the poem. The hero of this vast epic of voyaging, journeying, and traveling is literally the man of pain. And so writes Mendelssohn, he is the one who travels, he is the one who suffers, and how not? For a tale of travel is necessarily also a tale of separation, of being sundered, from the ones you are leaving behind. It is that pain we experience today as we remember, as we continue our own odysseys, our own journeys moving forward, because we must. Rabbi Schnur's column was about the first Yisker she observed without her grandmother, without her nana, and before our meditation, I want to finish with what she said that day. On these holy days, we pray with the people who were sacred to us from childhood, with the people we love who are no longer living, with the people whose values we adore and cherish, whose way of life we strive for, with the people who were to us what we hope to be for our children. What I want to say is simple that there is an empty seat full beside me. There is one next to all of us, a presence that we miss, an absence from which we will never recover, a wound that will always feel fresh to the touch. Isaac Besheva Singer once wrote, when a person who was close to you dies in the first few weeks after that person's death, he is as far from you, as far as a near person can ever be, only with years does he become nearer and then you can almost live with this person. You can almost sit next to their empty seat. She writes, we used to look around at Adath, Israel, Nana and I when we were used, when, and when we used to look around in the great big canyon of the synagogue we would always turn around quickly from the newly vacant seats as if they were mirrors. Nanas, right now someone is looking at your seat like that as if it were a mirror, but they needn't turn away quickly because in that seat is my heart. And you sit in it. And in your heart sits Simon. And in Simon's heart sits someone I don't know and on and on in a great hall of mirrors, all lit by a single candle, me. All of us here have our own hallways that go back and back and converge with others into one great sanctuary. And now in honor of these invisible people, next to uh, each of us in synagogue, in these great mirrored lives, in the great sanctuary, not of pews of wood, but one that we carry within us, we will say, ye score. <laughs>